So, perfect. I'm all set up. Um, yeah, welcome from my side as well. Um, as I said, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the very great introduction. So there is, um, I think, nothing more I can add for myself. The topic of today is C++ coroutines from scratch. Okay, so before we dive into that, there's one more thing I usually like to introduce um, about myself. I'm German. My last name is a very, very German um, word. It's an adjective in um, German. And you can translate it to finished, ready, complete, or completed. So it's a very nice um, adjective if you want to signal that you're done with something, especially for projects or so, it's, it's perfect. It's also occurring quite frequently in the language just um, the other week. Um, I had a mobile phone from a friend to configure and that one was set to German. And um, all the dialogues that you have to confirm that ask you to say that you're fertig with um, your change of the settings. So I, I didn't know that because my phone usually is set to English. But um, yeah, it occurs quite a lot of times. And it's always translatable to finished, ready, complete, or completed. So that's cute. But enough of the German lesson. Let's come back to C++. Coroutines versus functions, or functions versus coroutines. So where's the difference before we dive into all the technologies from C++? Here you have the comparison of a function compared to a coroutine, the control flow to be precise. So if we have a typical caller, that one calls a function, and then the regular function starts to run, run until a certain point where it returns. And that gives back the control to the caller. When this function returns, this is totally up to the control flow inside of the function. We can have single return functions, we can multiple return functions. What's in common is once I return, the entire information that this function currently had, all the variables on the stack and so far, they get destroyed. We are totally going back to the caller. And the caller, of course, can call this function again, but it will start with zero knowledge. So it always starts fresh. If you now look at the picture on the right, the control flow of a coroutine, there a caller places a call to the coroutine. And the coroutine now has the ability to suspend itself. Coroutines sometimes are also referred to as resumable or suspendable functions. So for doing that, a coroutine has basically two options. It can say co-yield or co-weight. These are two new keywords we receive in C++ 20. So in this case here, I'm simply using co-yield. So that means that my coroutine runs up to a certain point where it decides to suspend itself. So it co-yields usually a value to the caller. Now the caller has control for back and it resumes, but now it can invoke the coroutine once more. So it can resume it. And this time compared to the function, the coroutine starts where it left off. So it does not start again from zero, but it starts where we suspended it. So we resume it here. Coroutine runs again up to a certain point where it decides to yield the value again to the caller, meaning it put itself to sleep. My caller runs one more time, decides that it needs some more information from the coroutine, so it resumes the coroutine. The coroutine does some more work, and at the very end, it co-returns from the function. And this co-return is comparable to a regular function's return. That means that the coroutine has ended and you can no longer resume it, okay? So this is, coroutine has ended and throws away all its knowledge. Transferring control back to the caller and the caller resumes doing its work as usual. So this ability to suspend and resume, this is what makes coroutines so special and so helpful because they preserve their state. And it's not all the time that we want to have a function starting from zero. Sometimes we want to preserve 
the values in this function, the ability to resume it. And this is what coroutines offer us. Some background about coroutines. Um, coroutines are nothing new. If you look at other languages, they are there in, in Python and so forth. The term itself um, is already well established in computer science. It was first coined in 1958 by Melvin Conway. So it's a very old um, thing you can say. And it simply took C++ a long time to yeah, integrate it into the language. If you look at coroutines, we can see that they come in two different flavors across programming languages. We can have either stack full or stack less coroutines. And this form or the term here refers to where the information of the coroutine is stored. If we look back at the picture I just showed you, the ability of coroutine to resume or suspend and get resumed. There's no magic behind it. It simply means that the information we usually store on the stack inside a function gets stored somewhere else inside a so-called coroutine frame. So it's not a regular stack. You, we can say it's Let's compare it to a struct where we store all the things, the parameters to this coroutine, as well as all the variables we declare inside it. And because all this information is stored in a special place, we can keep it longer than just when the function suspends and then resumes. And now we have two choices where to store this coroutine frame. And this is either on a dedicated stack or on the heap. And C++ goes for the stack less form. That means that all the time you create a coroutine, you have a dynamic memory allocation for this coroutine frame. Okay, so this is what this term here refers to. And this also tells you what happens in the background once you're creating a coroutine. Due to the nature of coroutines, that we can suspend and resume them, and by that pick up where we left off, we can also use them for implementing tasks, implementing a scheduler. And in this case, we are talking about cooperative multitasking because the task here has to give up control. So it has to play in well with the others. The benefit here is we do not get interrupted by some operating system scheduler. But I have an example about this later. In general, we can say that coroutines can simplify your code because we can replace some function pointers, aka callbacks, with coroutines. And that makes the entire control flow better visible. Um, parsers, when we write them with coroutines, become more readable. And this is to some part that a lot of the state maintenance code we need for these things is no longer required because my coroutine now does the bookkeeping. And um, this is something the compiler establishes for me in the background. So this is all um, very nice and helpful. Although we interact with a coroutine, coroutines can be paused and resumed. And I already told you we have the two keywords co-yield and co-wait in C++20, which can pause a coroutine. If you look at co-yield, we can say, say that this usually is an output action. We want to yield the value to the caller, to the thing that controls my coroutine. So the action here is an output action and the state of the coroutine is suspended. So after we co-yield something, the coroutine suspends, usually at least. The other keyword we can have, or the operation is co-return. So we can return from a coroutine. That means it's finished. This also is an output action. So we can have a void returning coroutine, but the coroutine in co-return can also return a value. So this is an output action. The state in this case is ended. You should never try to resume 
a returned and by that finished or ended coroutine. It's undefined behavior. And the next thing we have is call wait. So call wait is an input action. Call wait basically puts the coroutine to sleep, waiting for a value from the outside. So we have a way out with call yield, and we have a way into the coroutine with call wait. And we have one option to finish the coroutine by using call return. For call wait, the state of the coroutine at the end is spent at again. We can resume it, but it's totally optional to us as with call yield. If you look at the coroutine in C++, um, then we can see that for beginners, for starters, it's often not that easy. And one reason of that is that coroutines in C++ allow you to model nearly, I would say, everything. And once you have something that's so flexible, complexity comes with that thing. So let's decomplicate that a little and see through to the basics, okay? That should help you to write your own coroutine. Basically, we can say in C++, a coroutine consists of at least two things. Something that I call a wrapper type. This is the return type of your coroutine's functions prototype. So if you have a coroutine and we look at the return type, this is the thing I call wrapper type. The purpose of this type is that we can control the coroutine here from the outside. Okay, because we can suspend and resume it, there is something like a creation phase and we get a handle back. And now we can, with this handle, control the coroutine. We can resume it and the coroutine can suspend itself from the inside. And we can transfer values into the coroutine and out of the coroutine. And this wrapper type here gives us to control this handle to this coroutine from the outside world. So this is how we get data out or data into the coroutine via this wrapper type. And from a compiler's perspective, when a compiler looks at this wrapper type, it looks inside it and it looks for a name with the exact name promise type. And that thing there has to be a type inside my wrapper type. And this promise type contains customization points to the compiler that we can use to configure how this coroutine should behave. This gives us the full flexibility. This promise type here, it can either be a type alias, a type def, or we can declare the promise type as a struct directly in our wrapper type. We have once again, the full flexibility here. And um, I mostly in this talk will declare the promise type directly in the wrapper type. From a top level perspective, um, that's it. But there are two more things that we often use with coroutines. So we can also have an awaitable type that comes into play once we use core weight. Okay, not every coroutine co-weights. So if it doesn't co-weight, we don't need this type. But once we have a co-weighting coroutine, we also will have something like an awaitable type. And the fourth part is because the coroutine can be suspended and resumed, and it can technically run forever, it can produce an infinite sequence of, of data, iterators are something that often come along with coroutines that we can easily loop over the data the coroutine emits to us. So these are the four parts that a coroutine usually consists of. The first two are a must from a compiler's perspective. It will not compile otherwise. The third and fourth, especially the third, depends on whether you have a core weight in your code and then the compiler demands that as well. And the fourth part, well, that's just being nice to your users and giving them um, easy to use code. You can see a coroutine as a finite state machine, which it is, that can be controlled from the outside world and we can customize it with the promised time. 
the actual coroutine function that we write then, which uses the spelled words co you co wait co return, um, this is for the communication with the outside world. So whenever you see a co yield co wait co return inside a coroutine, that means that it starts talking to the outside world, either emitting a value there or awaiting some value. All right. So enough theory, let's have a look at code at this point. But before we look at that, I had to put this disclaimer um, into the slide set and it's the first time I'm needing something, but I felt that um, it really would help. So please note, um, I tried to keep the code you will see as simple as possible, focusing on coroutines only, okay? That means in protection code, I work way more with public and private, as well as potential getters and setters. I totally ripped them off here for this presentation. Um, additionally, I usually use way more generic code in production to keep my repetition slow. And this especially comes into play with coroutines. Well, I decided that I want to focus on coroutines. So I got rid of all the template code as well. So we will see the real basics at this point, because my goal is to help you understand coroutines at this point. And I'm confident that you can improve the code that you will see with the usual C++ best practices. Okay, you will have no trouble with that. Um, I'm very confident there. Well, the, the last sentence is, is usually very hard for me. Um, also, I never declare more than one verb per line. Trust me, I teach that. And the following slides will sometimes um, prove me wrong um, because slide code in this presentation is the only exception. Um, I will declare multiple variables in one line to fit them on the slide. It's nothing I do in production, but for talk code, it's all right. Okay, so let's have a look at a coroutine. Our first coroutine is a coroutine chat. So it chats with us or with somebody else. If you look at the code here at the top in A, there we see a function prototype, basically. We have a return type chat. And remember, this is what I call the wrapper type. So once we start scanning into this core routine, once we see the first co something, co yield, co wait, co return, we know and the compiler knows this is a core routine. So the second thing we know, if we go back to A, that chat here contains a promise type type. Okay, otherwise that thing will not compile. So we know chat is a wrapper type. We don't know anything more about it, but we know it must contain a type promise type. We then look into the coroutine's body into B. We can see the first thing it does is it co-yields a std string hello. All these co-yields, co-weights, co-returns get transformed by the compiler to a call to the promise type which contains functions, which we will see customization points. So my co-yield uh, call here will result in the compiler calling the promise type yield value function, but we will see that later. In C then we can see that I'm co-weighting a std string. So I'm simply stating the type here and have no precise value. I'm expecting just the type a std string and I'm C outing this directly. And then in D here, the final part of my coroutine, I co-return here. So that's my coroutine. Now if you look down in the function use in E, there we can see the first thing I'm doing here is I'm creating an object chat of my wrapper type type chat by assigning the result of a call to fun. And now remember a coroutine has to set up phase. So this is not like a regular function where fun directly returns me a result. Fun in this case, you can see it like if you have a constructor call, so you get an object back. And in this case, I get my wrapper type chat back. Well, that one contains a handle, as we will see, to my coroutine, enabling me to control the coroutine, which we can 
in a hidden way C that I do in F, where I call chat.listen. We haven't seen the wrapper type yet, but it seems to contain a function listen. And I'm C out in this value. So potentially it also um, contains a std string. And then in line number 16, I am calling a second function on chat answer. And I'm putting a std string as a parameter to answer. And then finally in H, I call chat.listen again, see out in this value. So if you run this coroutine, you will get the output that a coroutine starts saying, hello. And then my use function says, where are you? And then the coroutine replies here. So very basic um, chat will not survive anything, but um, it's a nice example. If you look at the promise type here, then what you're looking at now are plenty of customization points, enabling us to trim the compiler, the implementation here to our intended behavior, maximize everything we want in terms of efficiency and so forth. So if you go through this in A at the top, you can see the disaster, two variables in one line, I declared two std strings here, msg out, msg in. I decided to split them that we can directly see which is the way in and which is the way out of the coroutine, okay? In B now, we have our first customization point, unhandled exceptions, uh, unhandled exception. So all the functions you will see from now on, you have to spell them exactly like that because this is what a compiler looks for. And um, we're not going to talk about exceptions in this talk. So I simply do not implement anything here. That means that if there is an exception in my coroutine, my entire program will terminate most likely. In C, in uh, get return object, we have the option to tell the compiler how to construct the wrapper type. So this is how we enable users to have the wrapper type, which the compiler doesn't know really how to construct it. And in the promise type with get return object, we can construct this wrapper type. So in my case here, I'm passing a this pointer to chat, but maybe I also want to pass a string, some other information. This is something that a compiler cannot know up front. So this is how we teach it please construct chat with these parameters. And the result, of course, is simply a chat object. Then we have a function initial suspend here in D. This one is called once the coroutine was set up. So each co-yield, co-weight is called the suspension point. And before we can say anything else, there is this initial suspend suspension point. After the coroutine was created, we can decide what should happen. Should it return or should it run until it finds the first co-yield, co-weight, co-return? So this is a customization point. And the return type here is suspend always. So we got two new types in the standard library, suspend always and suspend never. And as they indicate, hopefully with the name, suspend always means the core team always suspends at this point and suspend never means it never suspends. We will see um, the two types, but we will also um, see the implementation um, briefly below later. Yield value now is invoked whenever we say co-yield. And we can see it's, it's a simple function call. In my case, it takes a std string by copy, and then I'm moving this parameter into my um, promise types msg out variable. You can provide overloads here. Um, you can have R value references. You can have contraf. You have, can have pointers. The, the full picture is here. So you can trim this here to efficiency. You can put limitations on what users might co yield and all that. Um, so, and the result here of a yield value 
is once again a suspend always or suspend never. So here we can say what should happen. In some occasions, we really want to not suspend once we co-yield it, but the usual way is to say, okay, I'm, I'm suspending at this point. Because I had a cool weight in my coroutine chat, we also need to cover that one. And when we have that, it looks for a function a weight transform. And here we can see it takes a stud string, but I don't give that parameter a name because there is no value transferred at this point, um, at least for my code. It's simply to invoke this function or potentially this overload if I have multiple array transforms implemented in this promise type. Now inside this array transform, you can see something that I um, grew to once using coroutines. I declare this struct awaiter here in H inside the function await transform. Awaiter here stores a reference to the promise type and it implements three functions await ready, await resume, await suspend. These three functions are what suspend always and suspend never implement. They are more customization points. So await ready always returns true in my implementation. Um, await resume here, this is called once the coroutine gets resumed. And that means I'm moving the value from the promise type here out. So I'm returning that one. So this is how the coroutine gets its value from the outside world. And await suspend here has no implementation. It takes a void coroutine handle. And we will see later an implementation that does more um, with this await suspend. And at the end in line 22 here, I'm returning a new awaiter object by dereferencing this here, making the reference PT come alive. The final two customization points down in I and E here are return value. Um, return value is invoked when we call return. So it takes a std string as well and stores that in MSG out. So it's comparable to yield in, in this case. The difference is return value returns always void. So we cannot say that we want to suspend or not suspend the coroutine here. The coroutine at this point, the return value returns void because the final suspend controls what happens after the flow of the end of the coroutine. So there we can say suspend always or suspend never. And in my implementation, it's suspend always. We now look at the wrapper type chat. You can see another thing in line number two that you shouldn't do at work, maybe at home and maybe at a presentation, but you have to be aware that you um, might get some folks to tell you that's really bad and they're correct, but it has to fit on a slide. So what line number two should visualize to you that a code that we just saw is copy and paste it here, okay? And the simplest way to show this is to include um, that way it works. The next thing I'm doing here in A is I'm creating myself a shortcut to coroutine handle of my promise type. And then I'm using that in B here. I'm declaring a handle and coro handle. And I use that one down in C in the constructor of chat. That one takes a point at the promise type. This is why earlier the um, get return object called chat with the this pointer. So this is how the promise type creates this chat. And now there is a handy function inside the coroutine handle from promise type. So there's a static member function, and this allows me to convert a promise type to coroutine handle because the machinery internally has a, well, call it mapping table. And this way now I have a handle to this coroutine and I can control it, which is quite nice. Because of this handle, a coroutine stores something that's more or less unique. So that means I do not want to copy a wrapper type because that would duplicate the handle. So what I allow here is the coroutine being move only. I'm only going for a move constructor in this case and ignoring the move assignment operator. And I'm swapping the, the handle from the other side with null pointer. This 
effectively also disables copy operations. So chat is only move constructible, but not copyable. And because I have this handle, I need to take care of it in the destructor. So in the destructor and E here, I'm checking whether the coroutine handle is still valid. And if so, I'm calling mcoro handle.destroy to destroy the coroutine finally. And now in F and G, we can see the two member functions that we earlier saw that my function use um, call. So listen here checks whether the coroutine is done or not. And if not, it resumes it. Remember, you should never resume a finished coroutine. That's undefined behavior. So check this before. And then in line number 18, I'm reaching via the coroutine handle to the promise type and then to the MSG out variable and moving that one out. So this is how I get from the promise type my std string to the caller on the outside from the outside world. And answer is the other way um, around. So I use the coroutine handles promise type MSG in to move the std string answer just received into my coroutine. And then I'm checking once again, is the coroutine already finished? And if not, I'm resuming it. Okay, so this is my wrapper type for my coroutine chat. If you look at this in a picture, then we can see I have the user code here. And this is what I write. Okay, this was in use. So I'm creating the coroutine fun um, to the object chat, calling listen, answer, and so forth. That means I have with chat this wrapper type. And this wrapper type we know always contains a promise type. And whether that promise type stores some data in form of T here is optional to the machinery. It's not so much to us because we need the information, but um, in terms of implementation of the compiler, the compiler doesn't care for the T. The same goes for my wrapper types functions, listen and answer. It's totally up to me. I can spell them how I want. I can totally ignore them and let users go wire the coroutine handle. Um, this is our part. And whether or not we store a coroutine handle in the wrapper type is also optional. So should we never have a need to refer to the handle, we can also ignore it. I have an example for that later. This coroutine handle now points to my coroutine implementation, to my coroutine frame precisely. And the implementation of my actual coroutine of the function fun, that gets transformed by the compiler. So all the co yields, co weights, co returns, they end up calling the coroutine frames, promise types, customization points. So the functions we implemented such that we can influence the behavior. And all the parameters, all the variable that we declare inside our coroutine, they end up on the coroutine frame because this is how our code gets transformed by the compiler making coroutines work. Before we continue, uh, two definitions. Um, for the rest of the talk, I will refer to a task as a coroutine that does a job without returning a value. And I will refer to a generator as a coroutine that does a job and returns a value, either by co return or co yield, doesn't matter. The two helper types I promised you we have final um, in final suspend, in yield value, and initial suspend. Suspend always, suspend never. Um, you can see the implementation down there, and the only difference between the two is whether a wait ready returns true or false. Okay, the rest is entirely the same. These are simple helper types when. We do not need any code going on there once this um, type gets involved. So suspend always says for wait ready, always false, while for suspend never, it always says true. So this is the implementation in your standard library. All right, let's look at another task for core team, interleaving two std vector objects. What I mean by that is I have two std vectors, A and B with a couple of numbers, and I want to have a value of A first, then a value of B, then a value of A, then a value of B, and so forth. So they should be interleaved. It could be that one of the two stood vectors contains more values than the other. So if one is exceeded, the other one 
prints all its values without anything from the other side. So as long as they are equal, we get once A, once B, once A, once B. How do we do this? Well, here's my function interleaved. This is a core team. You can see that because in line number four, we can see a core yield. In line number 12, we can see a core yield. So it's a core team. That means we know that generator here as the return type of interleaf is once again a wrapper type that contains a promise type. Interleaf here takes two stood vectors of int A and B as parameters. In line number three, I'm using a lambda. Lambdas can be coroutines as well. So my lambda here also returns a generator. It doesn't capture anything and it takes a std vector of int by reference. Internally then, it has a range-based for loop that loops over the values of the std vector and co-yields a value at the time. So very simple thing. Then in line number seven and eight, I'm creating two new variables x and epsilon by invoking the lambda once with the parameter a and once with the parameter b. So effectively, x and epsilon are now two coroutines that yield the value at the time from my std vector a and b. It's simply purification of the code that follows. And it shows that we can have lambdas as coroutines. So in line number 10 now, you can see a pattern that's often occurring with coroutines. We have this while loops or for loops. Sometimes there are also infinite loops um, or appear as infinite loops. My while here checks x dot finished and epsilon dot finished. More precisely, it checks that it does not return true for x and epsilon dot finished. If one of them does not return true, we go into the body of the while loop and there the same check is once more. So if x is not finished, then we go into this um, body of this if and we co-yield x dot value. And after that, we invoke x dot resume. So we see that our wrapper type this time contains a function finished, value, and resume. And we do the same thing in line number 16 for x, uh, for epsilon again, pardon. So we first look at the x, yield the value if one's there, then we look at epsilon, yield the value once it's there, and then we are going back to the beginning of line number 10 and do the same thing. So this is how we interleave the two stood vectors. How does my promise type look? Easier than before, I would say. So my promise type here stores in line number two a member val, type int. In line number four, we can see the function get return object, my first customization point. That one returns a generator passing the this pointer. Now we can see initial suspend this time, return suspend never. So post to the chat version, this one does not return once the coroutine was set up. So it runs to the first co-yield, co-weight. And the reason for that is that I want to have a value um, once I first reach the coroutine here. Final suspend says always, the yield value says always, and the yield value takes an integer, stores that one in its internal member, and then returns suspend always. We have another function here because I have no co-return. This function implements another customization point, return void. It doesn't do anything there. And unhandled exception as before is empty. You don't handle exceptions at this point. My wrapper type now looks like this. I have my std generator here, my struct, and I do the same thing as before. I have a handle, it's a shortcut to my coroutine handle promise type, a store in line number three, a variable and curvo handle here. And then I have my constructor in line number five. The one does the same thing as for the coroutine chat. It calls handle promise uh, from promise type to convert my promise type to a coroutine handle. With the move constructor here, I'm disabling copy operations and ensuring that the handles are swapped correctly. I have a destructor that cares for destroying the coroutine before the wrapper type gets destroyed. And then we have the three 
well, functions um, that are unique now to this generator. Value, that one uses the coroutine handle promise type value to fetch the value that the coroutine just produced. I have a function finished, it's just a little bit of sugar to refer to the coroutine handles function done to check whether the coroutine is, is finished or not. And I have this function resume, which uses finished and if finished returns false, then we are resuming the coroutine. So this is just a little abstraction to um, having users reach for the coroutine handle and for all these functions. So that's basically it. Um, this is the promise type, this is the generator for it. And if we start using this coroutine, then I can declare two student vectors A and B here with a couple of values. I create a coroutine in line number six by calling interleaved. I'm moving these two student vectors into the coroutine. I'm giving that one the name G. It's a generator. Now you can see in line number eight, once again, I'm calling g.finish. So if it's not finished, I'm going into the while loop and fetching a value with g.value here. And then in line number 11, I'm calling g.resume. So this is my coroutine that interleaves two to vector objects. It works. It's okay in that sense, but I don't want my users to have to write this while loop code. First of all, it's a while loop that feels bad. And then users have to know finished value and resume. That's a burden. So our next test is, I would say there's a plastic surgeon required. Not one that reconstructs um, any kind of skin, but more our source code. So I'm really sure you all chime into this. Um, we would prefer a range-based for loop over this while loop I just presented you, right? So let's do that. Let's make it easy for our users. To have a range-based for loop there, um, our generator objects needs to fulfill the requirements for an iterator concept. That means it must be equal comparable, it must be incrementable and dereferenceable. So the easier thing here is to clear to declare the type you will see on the right inside my wrapper type generator. But you can also move it somewhere else and use it. You know all this. So what I'm doing here in line number one, I have the struct Sentinel. Um, it's an empty struct which I need for my comparison operator to make that one work. In line number three, my iterator starts. So it stores a coroutine handle. And then it implements the operator equals equals. And that one takes the Sentinel object. And the reason for that here is the coroutine itself knows when it ends. So if you have a coroutine that, for example, processes a sequence of bytes from the network, you don't really know when it ends. You might know when a message ends, um, but you don't know when the other side stops transmitting, at least not in all cases. So the, you don't know this upfront, but the coroutine knows when it's finished. And that means that in this case, for this iterator, we don't need the end part because the end doesn't really exist. It's, it's nothing we know upfront. So for having the ability to invoke this comparison operator here, we need something like a tag type here, simply to invoke this function. And then we call mcoro um, handle.done to figure out whether the coroutine is finished or not. So this is what we want here. And this is why I have the sentinel type. And then we can see I implement operator plus plus. So the pre-increment operator here, that one calls the resume function on my coroutine and then returns a reference to this. And finally, in line number 17, I have the dereference operator, which reaches for my coroutine's handles promise type value handing out the value to a potential caller. In our struct generator, what I need in addition is the functions begin and end. Begin here returns an iterator and passes to coroutine handle and here returns a empty sentinel object. And what this enables me now, I can rewrite the code from before. I can now say, okay, I have two two vectors A and B. 
I call my coroutine interleave, moving those two stood vectors into it. And now I can use my range-based for loop in line number six at the bottom. I can say for const order ref e colon g. And then in the body, I can simply see out the variable e. So my users no longer have to know anything about resume and value and whatever it was called. This is the code my users want. And this is why a lot of coroutines come with implementations for iterators, but it's somewhat optional. Okay. All right, excellent. So let's look at another task, scheduling multiple tasks. Before we do this, um, what's the difference between cooperative and preemptive multitasking? So with preemptive multitasking, the thread has no control over when it runs, on which CPU, or for how long it runs. In comparison, in cooperative multitasking, the thread decides how long it runs and when it is time to give control to another thread. Okay. So here we have a different way of controlling what we are doing. And for some things, this is highly desirable that you do not get interrupted. That also means that in cooperative multitasking, we don't need locks because we do not get interrupted unless we give up control. So that means the code here can become easier, but it has other drawbacks, of course. What I mean by scheduling multiple tasks. So what I want is something like this. I have a scheduler object schedule, and then I'm creating two tasks, task A and B, and I'm passing the scheduler to them. And then in line number eight, I'm calling scheduler to dot schedule to schedule the tasks. Okay, so this is basically something our operating system does in some fashion in the background. For the purpose of this talk, my task A and B are more or less the same. The only difference is that one says A, the other one says B. So the control flow here is um, once the task gets started, it says hello from task A. Then it co-waits by calling the scheduler suspend function. Once it gets resumed, it says A is back doing work. Then it co-waits once again. And once it gets resumed the second time, it says A is back doing more work. And B does the same thing, except for A, it says B. Okay, So you can create better tasks, but for the purpose of this talk, I think that's um, all right. So what do we need? Here I have my scheduler. My scheduler starts in line number two, having a stood list of coroutine handles. My coroutine handle, in this case, you can see does not take a template parameter, so it's a void coroutine handle, because I do not care about the actual type of this coroutine. I just want to handle to invoke a couple of primitives here. So I call this list tasks here, and then I have the function schedule, which returns bool. And what it does is it takes the frontmost tasks, stores it in a variable, pops that one from the list, and then it checks whether this task is done or not. If it's not done, it gets resumed. And the result here of my function schedule is whether my list of tasks is empty or not. If not, well, we have to continue and otherwise the program is technically finished. I have the function suspend here then. Suspend returns a, a waiter object and I'm showing you a, a different implementation here. A waiter this time derives from suspend always. It stores a reference to my scheduler. And I use this technique here because it should say that, well, the implementation of this awaiter is equal to suspend always. So it always suspends. It just does a couple of um, things differently. And because I'm deriving here now from suspend always, I have to implement a constructor, as you can see in line number 19, to well set up the reference. And in line number 20, you can see the only difference to suspend always. I'm implementing a wait suspend. So this one here receives a coroutine handle as a parameter, and it uses that one 
to store it in my schedulers tasks list by pushing it back there. So that's the first time I'm using a weight suspend really. And this is what um, this thing does. And then I'm returning a, a waiter object. So this is my scheduler. And this here is my wrapper type, including my promise type. So that might be the smallest um, wrapper type, promise type combination, combination you can have. Because for my tasks here, I do not need the wrapper type to control the coroutine in any way. So I'm not caring for anything here. I'm not storing the handle in the wrapper type. It's simply getting this thing alive. And that means that I have to have this wrapper type containing the promise type as I do have it here. As a consequence of that, my wrapper types get return object returns a default constructed task object. Initial suspend here is never. Final suspend is never. My coroutine returns void here and unhandled exception does nothing. So because I'm not really transferring values in or out of this coroutine, there are no functions to handle that one. This is how you can implement a very, very basic scheduler. What if you want to do it differently? Say you want to follow this approach. You have still the function use, but for setting up the tasks A and B, we don't want to pass the schedule. We simply invoke them, we create them. And then in line number six, obviously we have a global scheduler object, G scheduler, which we call schedule on. So how does our coroutine look if you do this? First of all, our tasks now look different because they no longer take parameters. So my co-weight looks different. It does not reach for this global object. It calls co-weight and passes a temporary suspend object. So this is new here, a new type that I simply create to invoke co-weight. My scheduler looks a little bit different as well. So the stood list here of coroutine handles is the same as before. I now have a function suspend in it, which takes a coroutine handle, a void one, and pushes that back to my task list. And my function schedule looks as before. So popping one element from the tasks list, the first one, checking whether it's done or not, and and returning better, there are more tasks to schedule or not. So scheduler is a um, bit shorter now because some code got moved here. So in line number one, we have the global scheduler object. And in line number three, we have the suspend type that I'm co-waiting for. And in line number four, you now can see something new in C++ along all the other things. We can also have a cool weight operator. This is what I'm implementing here. And this cool weight operator must return some awaiter, so suspend always or suspend never. And I'm following the same technique as before. I'm deriving from suspend always, but because my awaiter this time doesn't need to store a reference, I do not need a constructor. So I really can see the only diff to suspend always is my await suspend. It's taking a coroutine handle as before in the other implementation. And now it calls gscheduler.suspend um, passing the coroutine handle. And in line number 10, it returns a default constructed awaiter. So with this modification, you can go for a global scheduler object as opposed to one that you have to pass around the entire time. So this is how you can schedule multiple tasks in C++ with coroutines. It means that they are cooperative, so they do not get interrupted unless they say co-await. Um, okay, that's the thing here. You have only one task, the main task, and the coroutines here model the other tasks. So you can, of course, mix that with threads or whatever you want, and then the scenario gets more complex and you start requiring locks again. A few restrictions about coroutines um, to close this one here. Um, some functions cannot be a coroutine. So constexpr functions cannot be coroutines and subsequently 
const eval functions from C20 can also not be coroutines. So there is no coroutine at compile time. Neither a constructor nor destructor can be a coroutine. I think that's sensible. I mean, what would a half created object be or a half destroyed object? That doesn't make sense that much. A function using var arcs cannot be a coroutine. And var arcs here is the C thing. So like printf does it. A very big function template on the other hand works because it ends up being a, a actual function with actual parameters. A function with plain order as return type or with a concept type cannot be a coroutine. Um, auto with a trailing return type on the other hand works. As a sort, um, a coroutine cannot use plain return. So we must either use cool return or cool yield. So simple return doesn't work. It will result in a compile error. And last but not least, main itself cannot be a coroutine. Same thing as a constructor. What would be if, if main is only half started? Would be um, interesting. Lambdas, on the other hand, as I showed you, in one of the coroutines can be a coroutine, which is really nice. Perfect. So if you like to know more about coroutines, um, you have plenty of options, of course, here in mind, you can subscribe to my newsletter and create the C++ 20 coroutines cheat sheet, or you head over to either LeanPub or Amazon and um, buy my book here, Programming with C++ 20. All right. Um, before I clear the stage for your questions, let me say I'm fertig. Thank you. <laughs>